SM-64 Navajo, America's first real shot at an intercontinental cruise missile, a ramjet-powered DART designed to cruise at Mach 2 Plus and cross continents. Pretty ambitious setup. Rocket boosters kick it up to speed, then a supersonic ramjet takes over for the long haul. The problem? ICBMs showed up and killed the vibe. Ballistic missiles hit faster, flew higher, and were way harder to stop, making Navajo look like a really pricey experiment. After a bunch of spectacular explosions during testing, they pulled the plug in 1957. But the tech didn't just vanish. The guidance systems, engines, and everything they learned fed straight into Atlas and the B-52's Hound Dog missile. Navajo didn't arm the Cold War. It taught it. And naturally, the Soviets were cooking up their own intercontinental cruise dream. LA-350 Budia! The Tempest. A Soviet gamble that ramjets could fly across continents and make gravity look stupid along the way. Basically, Navajo's twin. Rocket boost to get going, then a stratospheric ramjet screaming along near Mach 3 at the edge of the map. Too fast for guns, too low for early radars to handle well. It flew. It howled. It promised doom through sheer staying power. And then ICBMs showed up and stole the whole show. Ballistic trajectories were faster, cleaner, and way harder to knock down. Money dried up. Budia got axed around 1960. Its hardware turned into research notes, while its design bureau shifted gears towards space stuff. The myth? Total failure. The reality? It taught lessons that eventually built better cruise missiles and planetary probes. And while Budia chilled on the test range, America was cooking up something louder than plans and hotter than sanity should permit. Project Pluto, the missile that wanted to turn airflow into fallout. The concept of a wingless cruise missile, slam, boosted up to speed, then let an unshielded reactor superheat the incoming air for Mach 3. Treetop level flight with range that's basically absurd, all while dropping multiple thermonuclear warheads as it goes. It wasn't just insanely loud, the exhaust was literally radioactive, and nobody could figure out how you'd even flight test a flying reactor without contaminating half the countryside. The team actually proved the engine worked. Tori 2A fired up in May 1961. Tori 2C hit full power in May 1964. Then reality showed up. ICBMs were quicker, cleaner, and didn't leave a trail of fission products. July 1st, 1964. Pluto got canceled. The desert kept the hardware, and the files kept the nightmares. A doomsday concept that proved one thing. Just because you can build it, doesn't mean you should. Engines weren't the only nuclear fantasy. Things were about to get much weirder. NB-36H and X-6! A bomber that flew around with a reactor in its guts, just to answer one question. Can a crew actually survive being that close to the glow? They weren't powering the props with atoms. The reactor never touched the engines. It just sat there in a shielded compartment, pumping out data while the crew hung out up front in what was basically a lead and glass bunker. Test flights over empty desert proved a grim kind of success. Radiation exposure was survivable. Complexity was off the charts. Next up was supposed to be the Convair X-6, a real nuclear-powered bomber. On paper, it promised flight time measured in weeks. In reality, crushing weight, insane shielding requirements, contamination risks, crash scenarios that kept people up at night, and oh yeah, ICBMs made the whole endurance thing pointless anyway. 1961, program axed. The ED-36H proved you could fly with a reactor on board. It also proved you really, really shouldn't. The Soviets took the same dare, just louder, and in the middle of Siberia. Subtlety was never their style. 295 LAL, a bear that ate a reactor. Just like America's NB-36H, the Soviets stuck a reactor in the fuselage. Not to run the props, but to see what the radiation actually did and test if the shielding worked. Crew sat behind lead-lined glass up front, while instruments tracked radiation seeping through the airframe. On paper, next was the TU-119, nuclear turbojets with closed-cycle heat exchangers. No radioactive exhaust, just a ridiculous amount of plumbing. The trade-off? Insane weight versus survivability, plus crash scenarios nobody wanted their name on. Then ICBMs showed up with way simpler ways to deliver terror, and the bear quietly retired its reactor experiment. The whole thing proved two things. Yeah, you can fly with a reactor on board, and no, you definitely shouldn't build a war strategy around it. Deterrence through weird science experiments, not actual combat sorties. While airborne reactors were losing altitude, Britain was perfecting something it was never ready to use. 
Blue Streak, Britain's polite sledgehammer, an elegant IRBM that died because someone did the math. Liquid oxygen and kerosene feeding twin RZ.2 engines. Clean burn pushing a megaton class message across Europe in minutes. Inertial guidance, tidy airframe, solid numbers. But here's the problem. Fixed silos are basically targets with addresses. LOX fueling isn't exactly quick. A first strike turns your fancy deterrent into instant rubble. The weapon looked great on paper. Survivability, not so much. 1960, program axed. The hardware got a second life as Europa Rocket's first stage. Good engineering recycled into space dreams. The myth? Britain chickened out. The reality? They moved the nukes to submarines and let the silos stay theoretical. Hiding missiles in fields flopped. So London decided the solution was wings. Lots of wings. GAM-87 Skybolt, a ballistic punch you launch from a bomber. The idea, keep bombers in the game by firing an air-launched ballistic missile from way outside Soviet air defenses, roughly 1,150 miles of standoff range, guided by inertial nav plus star tracker, packing thermonuclear heat. On paper, it would have kept the RAF's V-Force relevant for decades. In reality, Polaris subs and Minuteman ICBMs hijacked the whole mission. Quicker strikes, safer deployment, cheaper politics. After some test flops and brutal budget battles, Kennedy killed Skybolt on December 22, 1962. The Nassau Agreement flipped Britain to Polaris submarines instead, moving the crown jewels from runways to periscopes. The myth? Bombers got their long-range spear. The reality? Submarines kept it and kept it quiet. From missiles you drop to nukes you bury, Britain's next idea was somehow even colder. Blue Peacock, the landmine that brought chickens to a nuclear showdown. The plan? Bury 10 kiloton nuclear mines across West Germany and blow them by wire or eight-day timer if the seized came rolling through. Originally called Blue Bunny, seriously, each device weighed about 7.2 long tons, basically a steel coffin with major diplomatic baggage. The problem? Winter. Bury a bomb and it gets cold. Cold mechanisms might not work. One brilliant solution someone floated? Seal live chickens inside to keep everything warm for a week. When this got declassified on April 1st, 2004, Everyone thought it was a joke. The National Archives had to clarify, the civil service does not do jokes. Engineers looked into less insane heating methods, but politics, fallout concerns, and the whole nuking allied territory thing killed the vibe. February 1958, the MOD's Weapons Policy Committee shut it down. The prototype, minus its core, ended up in a museum, and the chickens went back to just being chickens. Burying nukes got messy, so America pivoted to the let's just swat them out of the sky approach. Nike Zeus, swatting meteors with a stopwatch and a nuke. Built to catch incoming ICBM warheads, Zeus stacked massive interceptors, even bigger radars, and lightning-fast calculations. It even made headlines. From Kwajalein, a Zeus variant tagged an Agena D satellite in May 1963, America's first legit ASAT proof of concept. The myth? Deploy a shield, sleep soundly. The reality? Decoys, chaff, and sheer attack volume turned interception into a coin flip, while costs went through the roof. January 5, 1963, McNamara killed Zeus deployment and shifted focus to the follow-on Nike X instead. Zeus didn't just disappear, though. Chunks of it stayed operational as an ASAT system, Program 505, and the Atoll turned into a permanent test range. The tech lived on in phased array radars and nuclear-tipped intercept logic, the awkward foundation of early missile defense. It wasn't a city umbrella. It was a prototype for reality checks, proving that offense scales way faster than defense budgets ever will. From chasing warheads to hiding them in the waves and the wind, the Navy's next play pushed the time Line too far forward. SSM N9 Regulus 2, a supersonic sea launched punch that showed up too quick for its own good. Built to launch off ships and subs, climb on a rocket booster, then cruise near Mach 2 on a turbojet with inertial guidance. No radio signal for anyone to jam. Range? Around a thousand nautical miles of serious trouble. Test models even had retractable landing gear. One actually took off and landed at Edwards in May 1956 proving the airframe worked before budget axes started swinging. A submarine launch happened in September 1958. 54 test rounds got built. Then, the axe dropped. Polaris SLBEs made cruise missiles on subs look noisy, sluggish, and way too exposed. Regulus 2 got canceled late 1958. Everything shifted to Polaris instead. 
Some leftovers stuck around as supersonic target drones, but the big dream was toast. The takeaway? At sea, ballistic beats flashy, and staying hidden beats going fast. The Soviets planned a torpedo so terrifying, it rattled the people building it. T-15 Super Torpedo! A torpedo the size of a train car, built not to sink ships, but to annihilate entire ports. The specifications were so insane that it was over 1.5 meters wide, approximately 24 meters long, and weighed about 40 tons. Battery-powered, designed to carry a gigantic warhead to the coast. It wasn't about hunting fleets, but about destroying naval bases. But in reality, equipping that beast meant completely redesigning the first Soviet nuclear submarines and betting the entire war on a single, gigantic launch. In 1954-55, the plan was discarded. The Navy switched to using torpedoes and nuclear missiles of normal size. The ocean kept its secrets. The military doctrine maintained what little sanity it had left. Barely. Moving into the 1990s, the final cancellations of the Cold War brought about a general cleanup. The SRAM-2, the new stealth bomber nuclear warhead, was canceled in 1991. The Sea Lance, long-range anti-submarine weapon, was scrapped as the threat dissipated. The Giants went back into storage. Deterrence discovered how to be lighter. The weapons changed. The Madness? Not so much. See the next video! MBT-70, the tank that tried to jump into tomorrow and face planet on the way there. Just imagine. NATO decides they need one monster tank to embarrass every Soviet design rolling from the Elba clear to the Urals. Enter the MBT-70. If you've made it this far, subscribe, like, and turn on notifications for our channel. Tell me, which failed project would you strictly use to kill a spider in your house, and how much of the neighborhood would accidentally disappear with it?